So she's muted. All right, I think we should start. So it's a great pleasure today to have Lydia Patton. Lydia is a philosopher of science and a historian of the philosophy of science. Much of her work recently and uh, work in progress centers on philosophical analysis of science and the history of science. While recent work focuses uh, also on the development of gravitational wave astronomy, especially the LIGO project. And today, Lydia will be talking about the systemic analysis of the EOB and EMRI methods. Please. Thank you. And I want to thank you very much. And, and it's, it's wonderful to be here <laughs> in person. Um, and it's excellent to see everyone on Zoom. I think I should be looking at the camera. So hi to those uh, who are joining that way. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about an epistemic analysis of the effect of one body and extreme mass ratio in spiral methods. Um, and one of the reasons that I want to talk about this is that it, this is an example of a case where it seems at first as if there's a quite obvious philosophical analysis of these methods, but I think that actually when you look a bit deeper, um, there's a lot more to be said. Um, and so I want to—I I find this a particularly fascinating case. Um, so let me get into this. I'll, I'll just outline, as usual, what I'm about to do. Um, so the first thing that I'll be talking about is very briefly um, about two different, well, fairly briefly about two different kinds of uh, models of um, compact binary systems, um, the extreme mass ratio and spiral model and the effective one body formalism. Um, and then I'll be looking at two uh, related ways of philosophically or epistemically analyzing them. And um, I'm not going to exactly set them up as rivals, but I am going to say that these are, these are two candidates for giving a philosophical analysis. And I think that the second one is better. Um, or deeper, I should say. Um, and so the first is surrogative reasoning, which has uh, been inspiring a lot of discussion lately. And the second is what's called structural model explanations. Um, so I wanna say that, in fact, these are not completely separate, they're related, um, but that we might want to think, just to give away the punchline right away, we might want to think that effective one body and extreme mass ratio and spiral models or methods are forms of surrogative reasoning. It seems that way in the beginning, but I want to argue that they're actually more a form of structural model explanation and that that has something important to say about what we're doing with them. Um, well, about what scientists are doing with them. Um, okay, so of course, uh, what I'm going to be focusing on here are, uh, and, and this is just to keep the, the forest in mind when we're looking at the trees, um, are the methods of gravitational wave astronomy, looking at uh, interferometer data and how that yields evidence or information about uh, waveforms considered as indications of distant systems. Um, so that's just to sort of locate what we're talking about. Um, and so as is well known, and I'm assuming that, that this is not uh, news to anyone here. So I've, I've actually skipped a lot of the kind of explanation phase um, of this talk so I can get right into the um, discussion of what we're talking about. Um, there are three phases of a compact binary coalescence. There's the initial and spiral phase, uh, the merger phase and the ring down phase. Um, the, merger, the merger phase, I'm gonna talk about the two last ones first. The merger phase is difficult to model or notoriously difficult to model. Um, it's intractable using sort of normal dynamical methods. Um, there are techniques for modeling the merger phase as is well known, including uh, quasi normal modes, perturbation theory, um, and in general methods of numerical relativity. Um, in the ring, but the ring down phase and the in spiral phase, um, the late merger and ring down phase and the in spiral phase of a binary merger um, are going to be what we're going to be focusing on today. So um, in the ring down phase, the bodies have merged or at least mostly merged and are now effectively an irregular single body or at least can be viewed in that way. Um, but the motion of the body is still affected by the merger. So it's not as if this is something that's now moving entirely independently of, of, the, of the coalescence itself. 
Um, the effect of one body formalism, as we'll talk about in a moment, is a model of the late dynamics of a binary system merger. Um, so this is a, so the EOV formalism is talking about the late dynamics. The in spiral phase of a CBC is tractable using post-Newtonian methods and numerical rel relativity, but the cycles of the final in spiral just before the plunge into a merger um, is moving toward the merger and thus is more difficult to model. This is um, well known. The extreme, and I'll say something more about this in a moment, the extreme mass ratio and spiral method was developed to handle certain systems involving a very massive black hole merger with something that's much less massive, a body that's much, much less massive. Um, so this is, whenever I hear the, the phrase extreme mass ratios, I always think of an announcer, you know, extreme mass ratio. I can't do it, but um, <laughs> you just have to imagine, right? Um, something like this. Okay, so this is from a paper by Scott Hughes. This is just gonna be sort of a, a general presentation of what's going on. Um, so this is uh, talking about the motivation behind um, EMRI or Emory methods. I think some people call them that. Um, so there's an outstanding problem, which is the evolution of binary systems with strong gravity and compact bodies. This comes as no, no news to anyone. Um, although post-Newtonian approximations very successfully describe the evolution of these when the bodies are widely separated, there aren't any that work well when the bodies are close. Um, numerical relativity will be needed. This is a paper from 2000, by the way. Um, will be needed to accurately evolve and understand the dynamics of compact binaries in the strong field regime. Um, and at this point, uh, Hughes said numerical relativity is still several years away from being able to solve the most interesting strong field problems, such as the final and spiral and merger of binary black hole and binary neutron star systems. I actually think it's interesting. This is a paper from uh, the year 2000. This is, it's interesting to wonder, is this statement still true? Um, yes? Is, why are there so many errata? Is there any particular history of why? It's strange to see a paper that has errata that span like 14 years. This, I can't answer that question, okay. but that is an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, there are a ton of errata. Well, when was the, when was, was the breakthrough by the two thousand five? Two thousand five, so that's probably why. Two thousand two and three was the Even when oh. beyond that, it, it, uh, kind of odd, right? You wouldn't update it if the technique has changed. Just then. Yeah. But I, my my impression was, I guess Alfredo knows more about this too. But my impression was in the last just three or four years, it's been understood that weak field techniques uh, work much better than they have any right to, almost up because of this business, business about the vanishing of the numbers of the levels that they work much better than they have any right to. And the, the, the transition between the, uh, the weak field regime and the, uh, and the ring down phase is astonishingly quick. Um, and sort of saw that in numerical simulations, but um, yeah, yeah. The, I guess there's been, a, hasn't there been a discussion about that? Or, yes, yeah. I think there has, right? I mean, I, yeah. I think that- So it would, be, it, would be, it would be modified though. I don't know why you could do so much without numerical relativity. Whenever I hear a seminar on it, I ask it, I never get an answer. Oh. Okay, I, I'm glad that I'm not the only one who can't answer that, but I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. well, I think you're not one by the thing, right? Yes. Actually, I also the transition from the weak field regime to deep inside the plant stage. And yeah, and in, in a way, that's what I want to, this is good because this is the kind of what I want to emphasize, uh -huh. is that um, there's in both of these cases, in the case of he's going to, Hughes is going to start talking in a minute about um, the extreme mass ratios. But in both of these cases, there's um, the ability to kind of extend a model that does work into something that's less well understood. Um, is that an accurate way of, yeah. And so I think that's, that's kind of the move that I want to emphasize. Um, so what he goes on to say is there's, here's a case again, in 2000, before all the errata, um, <laughs> in which the two-body problem can be solved to very uh, high accuracy. And this is where you have 
an extreme mass ratio, right? So of course there are, if you have two bodies where the mass is very similar, that's well known uh, to be solvable. But then there's a case where you have one body with an extremely higher mass than the other. Um, and then the reason why you can use these methods, um, the reason why you can solve uh, the two body problem to very high accuracy in space is because you treat one of the bodies as a perturbation um, rather than as a body. And so then the dynamical models will work, but you're not exactly treating it as a two body problem. Um, is that an accurate way of, you want to judge that? Okay, good. Um, so this limit is of great interest. Um, since extreme mass ratio systems are among the most important candidate sources for LISA, right? I mean, so this is this is why people care about EMRI is because um, LISA is going to be up and running, and it'll be extremely cool to see uh, whether some of this data can be picked up. Okay, so this is an image from uh, via the LISA website of of what this might look like. Obviously, highly. Stylized. There are some really fun videos on YouTube that show the dynamics of an extreme mass ratio and spiral. Um, I didn't plug into those, but you can easily find them. Um, this is my extremely artistic rendering <laughs> of the extreme mass ratio. Okay, um, so the in spiral has thousands of cycles within the extreme gravity of the black hole and within the Lisa sensitivity band, right? So this is from Cole Miller, um, a recent presentation about um, what's so promising about EMRI methods. So I got a question. Yes. I go back to the animation that you were just trying to show. Like, yeah, the image that you are actually you are now in the, the world before, right? So I think that actually, I mean, it's just like a good picture, but at the same time, there's what turns out that your old piece becomes more and more eccentric. So yes. that's like, you know, we've shown that the yes. suits this actually, you know, basically a stellar mass black hole next to supermassive black hole as it always further and further and just get close because of the angular momentum of the system, you get more eccentric. Yes, yeah, so is this something that you have also thought of This doesn't play a huge part in the paper, but I didn't. I do notice this because it is very interesting um, because when you do watch the, the uh, simulations that people have come up with, um, it's very, when you start seeing the, the chirp yeah, um, in the system, the eccentricity becomes pronouncedly more yeah. more obvious right so it, it which is very interesting i have no idea what explains that um but i know you can just write down the equations and you really literally see that see it know? in the yeah. equation because of the loss in the angular momentum your uh, orbits as they get closer and closer they become more and more eccentric okay. so that's kind of that's kind of like it is it possible to actually to see in fact that's what we show and yes. um, i'm happy to I'm happy to talk with you later. But that would be wonderful. Yes, yeah. that's very interesting. Yeah, because it's it, it's highly noticeable and, and very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All it's right. Like similar to cosine and Lido oscillations, of course, that's yes. for the three-body system. But even for two-body, because of angular momentum, it naturally happens. It naturally happens. Yeah. The eccentricity becomes more. Right, right, right. Yeah. And this is, I mean, and, and this is, this is something that I think. Um, all of this is, is, is kind of leading to what I, I, I really want to emphasize, which is that um, there are certain cases, so in, in the case of EMRI, what, one of the things that you're doing is treating the second body as a perturbation. Another thing that's happening is that you're using linear um, approximation to study the system's evolution. Another thing that happens is that there are certain phenomena that become obvious, like the, uh, the angular momentum and the eccentricity. Um, and these are all incredibly important. Um, but what is often emphasized instead is the fact that we're regarding a two-body system as if it were a one-body system. Um, so in a way, and, and this, this isn't surprising because of who is here, we're getting the more interesting parts of the system out, out front. Um, but what has been emphasized more is the fact that this is a case where we're using one body um, to represent two bodies. Um, and this is something that tends to be emphasized both in the case of the MRI and in the case of the effect of one body formalism. In other words, emphasized by philosophers talking about this and by people talking about this from an epistemic perspective. 
Um, so in the case of the EMRI, this is the case, and also in the case of the effective one body uh, formalism. So the EOB approach defines, this is from the Bonanno and Moore paper, we're apparently around 1999 um, for right now. Um, we'll, get to, we'll get to the present at the end of the talk. <laughs> Um, but the effective one body approach defines in a non perturbative manner the late dynamical evolution of a coalescing binary system, right? So, this is what I talked about at the beginning. The idea is to map by a canonical transformation the two body problem onto an effective one body problem. You're probably all very familiar with this. Um, and when you turn off the radiation damping, the effective metric will be static and spherically symmetric, uh, deformation of the Schwarzschild metric. So this allows for the transition from in spiral to ring down to be resummed. Um, resum I just say here on the slide what resummation is, but effectively it's a way of, of um, giving a kind of a way of making a, a series converge that's initially divergent. And here I just want to pause and say in both of these cases, in the case of the extreme mass ratio models for the uh, late in spiral, and in the case of the effective one body models, effective one body formalism um, for the late stages of a merger, um, the way that these have been um, analyzed up to now, and I'm going to say something about what this means, is as a kind of surrogative reasoning, where for a two body system, we take one body to stand in for the dynamics of the whole system. And we think that the dynamics of one body, of, of, of one body system, um, in fact, can, can give us information by filling out through approximation or whatever, um, can represent the dynamics of the two body system. And I want to motivate a distinction between surrogative reasoning and structural model explanation and argue that this is actually a case of the latter. That's the philosophical content of this uh, discussion. Although I'm also extremely interested in talking about the physics to the extent which I'm capable of doing that. Okay, so, what is surrogative reasoning? Um, surrogative reasoning is a kind of structural representation, or it's analyzed as a kind of structural representation in philosophy. Structural representation in general, this is from Chris Sawyer's uh, representation. It enables us to reason directly about a representation in order to draw conclusions about the things that that representation represents. So we use one sort of thing as a surrogate in our thinking about another, and this is why it's called surrogative reasoning, right? So this isn't surprising. Um, this is, this has been um, more recently discussed by a number of philosophers. There's a major project going on right now. Um, Mauricio Suarez has developed uh, what he calls an inferentialist conception of representation using surrogative reasoning, where A represents B, only if first the representational force of A points to B. Philosophers say things like that. It just means we intend A to represent B, right? And so Secondly, A allows competent and informed agents to draw inferences regarding B. So this is fairly, yes. So, Sorry. I mean, in this particular problem, so you write down the exact equations and it involves two parameters, the little mass and the big mass. Yes. And then you um, expand in the ratio. Yes. So how is that any different than any other perturbation expansion? Like perturbation expansion of <laughs> Would you also say it's surrogate of reasoning when we compute the fine structure constant to one loop? What, what is the? Yeah. It's, so I, I wouldn't. I, this, oh, is, okay. this is my whole argument is this is not surrogate reasoning. <laughs> oh, um, that EMRI and EOB, in, in my opinion, are, are, are more along the lines of a structural explanation. And where a structural explanation means something more like um, deriving inferences based on equations about the behavior of the system. So that's that's ultimately my argument here. Um, I think that we've gone down a kind of cul-de-sac where people start talking about effective one body and extreme mass ratio in these kinds of systems as surrogates, um, like as maps or, or representative uh, uh, maps of the, of the phenomena. But I actually think that that's not what's happening. This is more like just derivations from the equations. Yeah, so yeah, I'm a little confused. I mean, how sure. is this different from the general idea of effective approximation? I mean, this is like a standard technique in physics, right? I mean, I mean, other than this particular problem, 
Yes. The idea of just paring it down and saying, okay, I just reduce the number of variables by taking on an approximation. Here, the approximation is that the second body can be treated entirely as a perturber, right? Yeah. And that you can. I'm missing, I feel like I'm missing something because. Yeah. Well, in a way, you're saying, I mean, I am agreeing, but in a way, then you might ask, well, what's the point? Because you might say, well, look, these are just cases. Why would you ever even want to think of these as surrogative reasoning yeah. or as this kind of representationalist reasoning in the first place? In which case I can say, great, I can go home because that was my point. Right. <laughs> um, but I think, um, I think there is an argument to be made. Um, I don't think it's an entirely wrong. Is it about explanatory power? Like what, what is yes. it about? Okay. So the idea behind the representationalist view is, so just to go into, into the motivation behind the representationalist view, is that what we're doing is reasoning about one system in order to draw conclusions about another system. And so just to give the toy example, you might reason about a map of the London underground in order to figure out what's going to get you from one place to the other, even though you know the map is just a representation of where you want to go. And so the argument, the motivation for the representationalist view would be, we reason about a one body system in order to draw conclusions about the two body system. And so the motivation there is that we're using one system that we know is not the right system, right? Um, is not the real system in order to draw conclusions about what we know to be the real system. So it's an analogy. So we, would, we would never say it that way. Yeah. We would write down the equations and say, okay, we think. Yeah. But, but, but could this be, so in, in superconductivity in the early days, yeah. they talked about uh, Cooper pairs. And they yeah. just, Cooper pairs, they sort of pulled them out of a hat. And uh, that, I mean, more yeah. than this one, but they pulled them out of a hat and they argued about that system in order to understand properties of superconductors, but then of course they did experiments. Yes. That 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 indicated that this surrogate model was getting some things right. Yes. And um, yes. Yeah, but then there was another step. It's not an approximation, but an experiment. Right. So that's all. And the 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 idea behind this, the, the motivation behind this is exactly that, that you can take something that almost seems like it's fictional or, or pulled out of a hat is the nice way of saying it. Um, and this nonetheless tells us something about the real system or the system, the target system. So the Bohr model of the atom is another example or the kinetic theory of gases or something like that. Nobody thinks that gases actually work that way. But nonetheless, we think that we can say something about the sort of balls uh, bouncing around model. And that tells us something about the target system, even though we know the target system doesn't actually work. Um, and so the argument behind the representationalist view is that what we're doing is looking at a system that we have conceived as in some way correctly representing the target system, even though it doesn't resemble the target system. And so the argument there is, look, we know that these aren't one body systems. We know they're two body systems. But the representation of them as one body systems is nonetheless informative. And so that's the point of using the representationalist views that this isn't just an approximation or an idealization. It's a representation of one thing in terms of another thing that isn't that isn't really like that. Sorry. Well, um, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Yes. When I think of other analogy. I think a real analogy, maybe the Cooper pairs is, is kind of an analogy, but I think of the water analogy for black holes, like that work that yeah. Silica Feinberger does, right. where she has whirlpools, and you can set up certain standing shocks that mimic, in some sense, mathematically event horizons, and you can bounce things off of that. You can look at super radiance in a certain way. Yeah. That, that seems to me a real analogy because that's water right. taking the place of gravity. You know, and you can see these nice wells, and you can, see, you can think to yourself, wow, that's kind of like a gravitational well, but in water. Right. In your definitions, is that which of your two uh, arguments does that belong to? Is, or is, that, is it a pure form of analogy? That is, that is the case of surrogative reasoning. That's a pure surrogate of reasoning. Because you're saying, well, because you're saying that 
this. It's not clear cut, right? It's not clear cut. It's difficult because I mean, and and this is this is in a way um, what I want to say. So let me try to let me try to be clear. Um, on the one hand, you might say that's a clear case of surrogative reasoning because we're not saying she's not saying that um, black holes are actually pooling or flowing or anything like that. Um, that they're not actually behaving as water. They're not made of water, right? Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, and this is where the structural model explanation comes in, and I haven't yet said what that is. Um, the reason that the analogy works is because there's a general theory of fluids that can constrain um, the analogy, right? So it isn't just saying, oh, hey, it looks, water, water's behavior looks like the behavior of black holes. Mm -hmm. It's saying there's a theory of fluid dynamics that governs both of them. And that's why the simulation works. That's why the analogy works. Um, is because there are, there are sort of substantial structural ways of drawing an analogy between the two fields that's gonna allow us to draw conclusions about one domain from reasoning about the other domain. And so this is kind of the fundamental move here is that the representation itself works because there's a structural explanation in the background mm -hmm. um, that's actually making that representation possible and valid. That's my ultimate argument. So I'm just gonna give it rather than going through the slide. So that's the argument is that when we try to represent one domain by reasoning about another domain, it doesn't work just because you say, well, I can make something up and represent this one thing in terms of the other thing. It works because there's something deeper structurally going on that allows us to explain one thing in terms of another. That's okay. the idea. Okay, I, sorry, I know you had your hand up. So I'm maybe confused a little bit about this operationally. So an example that I think confuses me is you look at the standard model of particle physics. Yep. Quantum field theory, and even in particular, it's effective field theory. I mean, so you could say, well, what is a quantum field as an object? Is it is it something that actually reflects the underlying reality, or is it just some useful conceptual tool that we use to reason about the way that particles are? Yeah. It seems that operationally, the way that the attitude of physicists, as far as I think, at least, is that well, it's useful insofar as the pictures that we have in our heads about quantum fields and the equations associated with them allow us to make good predictions. And that's the sense in which it's a correct picture to have in your head. Right. If it could be replaced by another, even more correct picture eventually, or whatever it is. Right. But I guess, what, what, how does it help us think about what we mean by the equations if we think of, how do I say, operationally, what is the utility in thinking about one this conservative reasoning versus representation or I mean, how does it help us conceptualize what it is that we're doing? Yeah, so this is cheating, uh -huh. but I let me let me go through a couple more slides sure. because that's that's what's going on here, right? So um, surrogative reasoning is thinking about one the about a vehicle as an epistemic representation of the target, right? So the Bohr model of the atom is an epistemic representation of the of atomic dynamics, right? So that's the idea behind surrogate reasoning. And this is true if and only if you can perform valid, but not necessarily sound. This just means you can perform inferences that work, but aren't necessarily true um, between the vehicle and the target, right? So this is, uh, this is Gabriela Contessa. He talks about this as a condition for valid surrogate reasoning. And he says, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for epistemic representation. So the argument here is if you wanna represent one system in terms of another, you have to be able, this is again, the inferentialist picture. You have to be able to derive valid inferences from one system to the other. Um, now, what I think is important about this is that there's a kind of strong way of thinking about surrogative reasoning, which is just, again, we pull something out of our hat and even if it's entirely fictional or sometimes people talk about counterfactual, even if it doesn't represent the target system at all, we're nonetheless able to make valid inferences about one system based on what we say about the other. Um, this would be the kind of strong representationalist or surrogative reasoning view is that there doesn't need to be any real connection between two systems in order for one to serve as a valid surrogate of the other. 
And the argument is, as long as we can draw the, the necessary inferences, the two systems don't really need to resemble each other in any relevant way. The, the point that I want to make is that may very well be true, right? And there have been cases, and there are people who defend this view who have, who have mentioned these cases. There have been cases where this is quite clearly true. Oh, that is great. <laughs> Um, and now I'm going to be thinking about the Pink Panther all day. Okay, so um, <laughs> so that's so the idea behind the representation, the strong representationalist view, is that it really doesn't matter what you put up as your as your vehicle, as long as valid inferences about the vehicle give you valid inferences about the target system, then you're good. Yeah. Um, what I want to argue is that the reason. <laughs> in cases where these inferences are actually valid. The reason is that we've actually um, caught on to something that's closer to a structural explanation. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I wanna say is that there, there's kind of, when you, when you defend the strong representationalist view, there's a kind of idea that there doesn't need to be any restriction at all on using a target system, you know, using a vehicle to represent a target system. And you can do whatever you want. You can pick whatever system you want to map out whatever other system. And as long as you fit this criterion, right? As long as you can draw valid inferences about the target from the vehicle, you're good. That's the epistemic criterion that's necessary. My point is in virtue of what does the vehicle, does, does your, your, what you're using to represent actually represent features of the, of the target system? It's because there's a structural explanation functioning in the background. And that explanation is much closer to what's normally considered in physics to be a good explanation, namely that you're able to give some kind of approximation or perturbation or resummation method or something that allows you to show that this can be related in the right way back to some solution to the equations or to some model within theory. And so my, what I wanna argue is that there's representationalism could be completely true and we still want to say in virtue of what does the representation work and in that case we want to talk about structural explanations Sorry. is valid that surrogative reasoning as you or sometimes i find it does it have the property that it always leads to correct conclusions? so this is the reason for valid though not necessarily sound so sound would be always correct but contessa explicitly says they have to be valid, but not necessarily sound. So the inferences, there has to be a good reason to believe that inferences about one system will lead to inferences about the other, but they don't always have to be true or correct or even accurate. So if I were to use the Bohr atom to compute some correction or something, yeah. it might give the wrong answer. That would still be valid surrogate reasoning. It would still be valid if it were, if it were, if you could show that there were some justification for representing one in terms of the other. Yes. It seems puzzling because the justification at the end of the day is always the correctness of the <laughs> Well, okay. So let me let me let me back up here. What I kind of what I really like about this discussion is that I'm I'm kind of preaching to the choir. So I'm like I I so, so I think that a lot of this, I'm like, yes, let's, let's just get to the point because this is what I want to say. Um, I'm trying to sort of break down all of your, I want everyone to say, but that can't be right because representationalism is just so obvious and, and true and, and okay. But so I think that um, the motivation behind this kind of claim is that there are going to be a lot of cases where there are sort of counterfactual models that do actually yield some kind of information about a system, even though we know that part of them is wrong. So fluid dynamics is a really good case, right? There are a lot of models in fluid dynamics that um, treat fluids as perfect continua, but they're not. But the models still give good uh, solutions, right? We, we, can't, we can't give um, solutions to certain equations without assuming that fluids are perfect continua, but they're not. Okay. So the continuing solutions mechanics. are relevant and they work only when that approximation holds, right? So when right. that approximation doesn't hold, then yes, <laughs> and that so so this is so the so this is exactly 
I really sort of hate to do this because I, I this is exactly the move that I want to make is to say, look, there are cases, continuum mechanics, fluid mechanics, et cetera, where we're making these kinds of assumptions that fluids are perfect continua, that certain materials are perfect continua. There's a domain of validity. That there's a domain of validity and you have to be able to show when you remove the approximation that it is actually sound. And so I think this is the mistake of the kind of strong representationalist view is the idea that no matter what you do, you're sort of allowed to represent one system in terms of another, as long as you can show that there are these valid inferences that can be made back and forth between the systems. And my point is that in fact, what's going on in these kinds of systems where this actually does work is something that's much more familiar in physical and mathematical reasoning, that what's happening is you pick a system that has a feature that allows for this kind of uh, successful solution. Um, then you, so in the case of effective one body and extreme mass ratio, you pick a system that has a feature that allows one body to stand in for the dynamics of the entire system. And so the Hughes paper, errata notwithstanding, <laughs> is very careful about saying this only works for certain systems. This only works for certain, in certain cases, right? It doesn't work every time. Um, and then in those specific cases, you can model the system using one body dynamics. And then you find a way to remove the approximation to represent the extra body somehow as a perturbation using resemination theory, whatever. But you find a way to show, to link the second body back in um, to what you're doing. And we 100% do not need this slide. Um, and so then what happens is, um, I would argue something closer to what Alyssa, uh, Elisa Bakulich has, has called a structural model explanation. Um, this is one where you should that, and I think this is what's been kind of suggested here, a structural explanation in general is one in which the explanandum is explained by showing how the mathematical structure of the theory limits what sorts of objects, properties, states, behaviors are admissible within the framework, and then showing that the explanandum is in fact a, a consequence of that structure. So showing that there's a deeper fact about the theory, about the dynamics of the system and so forth that explains why in that particular case you've actually got an explanation. And then uh, Bakulich argues that extending this account of scientific explanation to models, you can define a structural model explanation as one in which not only is there a pattern of dependence on the elements of the model, but this dependence is a consequence of the structural features of the theory that's employed in the model. And what I wanna argue is that structural model explanations pick up on, and I wanna, actually finish quickly because I assume that there will be some discussion. Um, what I want to argue is that structural model explanations pick up on a method that's very frequently used in physics. Um, you find a tractable solution to the problem of interest. So here, this is the case both in EOV and EMRE methods. You know, you find solutions that do work, weak field, one body dynamics and so forth, right? You find a way to fit novel phenomena into the domain that's covered by that. Um, sometimes by constraining the domain, sometimes by saying, well, it only works in these certain cases. And then you broaden slowly the class of phenomena that you can handle. So you use this as kind of a probe or a means of investigation, and then you broaden it out, right? Again, not news to anyone here. This is the kind, I would argue, of structural explanation that's used in Emory and EOB, and it's, it goes well beyond this kind of surrogative representation of one, uh, one system by another. So in this case, we, what we got our systems where that, you know, where the system only has certain features, the mass ratio has to be huge in uh, Emory methods. And in the EOB, we have to look at the late phase of the merger and the ring down. Um, so strengths of this method of structural model explanation include modeling systems using well-established solutions. This is something that, you know, this is just the way it works. You find a system, you find well-established solutions to dynamical problems, and then you find a way of extending them. You find systems where known methods can account for deviations like perturbation or metric deformation. And then these methods aren't the only ones out there, so they can function as a check on others. Um, so let me, so, so I point out a couple of cases where this actually works really well. Um, but it, like I say, I wanna finish up quickly so we can have time for discussion. One case is that um, Demour and Bonanno are able to calculate the innermost stable circular orbit for comparable mass systems. This is something that I would argue 
is not something that um, that actually gives you an accurate value for the ISCO rather than just saying, you know, we can represent one system in terms of the other. This is an actual substantive prediction. And I would argue that this is only possible because there is something deeper that's been caught on to rather than just representation. Um, Demore also points out in his introductory le lectures on the, on the EOB formalism um, that there is actually a, a, a methodology for the EOB that consists of studying the physics behind each feature of the waveform and then systematically comparing EOB-based waveforms with exact waveforms obtained by numerical relativity approaches. And so here they look at the small mass ratio limit, for instance. And so one of the things that I think is interesting here is that it's the what's interesting about the, the structural explanation in this case is that once you've defined a structure where you can actually allow one solution to be extended in a particular domain, if you can show that that's um, sufficiently related to another type of solution, then you can give substantive uh, a substantive basis for the comparison between those two types of results. Um, I won't say a lot more about that because I don't want to take up a lot of time, but that's something that I think is really interesting. What, what year was that? Um, this one was, I think this was 2000. Sorry, so this was a while ago, yeah. Um, okay, so they were, Buonanno and Thibault were able to provide predictions for the ISCO for the binding and energy and the orbital frequency. And these can be compared with the inferences drawn using standard interferometry and waveform analysis. Um, and then I just want to say briefly that obviously the interest of working on EMRI is as a probe of strong field gravity for space-based interferometers, right? And um, this is something, the ability to solve the field equations in the case of EMRI is key to being able to draw valid inferences using space-based interferometry. And there's actually been a, um, some interesting recent work. I did promise we would get to recent. This is from 2020. Um, arguing that, in fact, um, there is a possibility that the EMRI um, could be blocked by um, background radiation in the case of uh, LISA and space-based methods. And so this is something where more work needs to be done in the future. But one of the things that I think is interesting is there's a lot of um, obviously fascinating prospects for fundamental physics with LISA. As is, uh, argued by this recent paper, tested the nature of black holes, dark energy, dark matter. So this kind of links up with the last paper by Siska de Bettemaker. Um, and so there's a lot of really fun and fascinating physics that can be done um, using the space-based interferometers. And so I think this is something that makes it worth studying EMRI. Um, so the use of methods where one body is used to stand in for the dynamics of the system has the following advantages. Um, it can serve as an epistemic check on waveform analysis using other models, but it can also open up the class of systems that can be analyzed using current methods, as long as you can show that there's a valid method of approximation or extending systems uh, to new types of systems that can be investigated. These advantages, this is a, my only argument, I'm not making any more argument than this, are not derived only from the ability to represent a binary system using a single body. It derives its usefulness from a deeper structural model explanation in the terms um, that we discussed. Um, and so this means that they should be more deeply studied because this method of explanation is common in physics and mathematics and is one of the most fruitful methods that there is. So, thanks. All right, yeah, question. Uh, thank you for a beautiful and very thought-provoking talk. Um, I wanna go back to uh, a few questions and thoughts that were voiced, and yeah. in particular, I want to go back to Shep's example of the, the fluids. Yes. Um, I think there's a really nice thing to, to say here, which is just that take super radiance, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's actually go back to high school physics. Just take the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is something that happens in sound waves, in light waves, in all kinds of ways. Can you go straight ahead? I'm gonna, that's, okay. <laughs> and, and so um, I think the, the, the reason for the Doppler effect happening, irrespective of the wave, you know, in question, whether it's sound, whether it's light, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is because um, 
is because I think there's a there's a good structural explanation, which is that when you have a signal and the source is moving, that's basically all you need to compute something like the Doppler shift or something like that. Right. I think superradiance is basically exactly the same thing. So when you have a system that's you know rotating and you send stuff at it, whether it's water, whether it's honey, whether it's gravity, whatever it is, there's going to be some form of super radius. It's kind of a generic thing. And there's a beautiful structural story as to why that's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, let's think about uh, let's think about merger. There's yeah. there's nothing like a uh, uh, a theoretical mathematical understanding of, of what's going on that could stand in and play the role of those things in those examples that I just mentioned. Like the right. really simple analysis in the Doppler case of when you have sources moving or you have a receiver that's moving with respect to the source, there's going to be a shift no matter the way. Or the super radiance case, which is when you have angular momentum, you have a wave approaching that system, there's going to be some form of super radiance. There's nothing like that in our in our mathematical, to my knowledge anyway, in our mathematical understanding of black hole collisions or anything like that, that they could, uh, you know, that, that could act as a binding structural understanding of, of, the, of these systems, which would enable us to kind of understand why our approximations are working in a certain regime where maybe we don't expect them to, or uh, other types of, of, of um, you know, things that we talked about. So from my perspective, it's really extremely exciting and extremely difficult uh, understanding mathematically what's going on in these in these ring downs or in the collisions which would account for it for instance why these one body formalisms are actually pretty good and maybe yeah. beyond what what in your words that they have any bites I, I think there is one there is some understanding of why it is more universal than what has presented what has been presented here it's just not widely accepted and these things take time to process so there is some understanding why, well, in the 1999 paper, ELB was proposed for spherical, spherically symmetric background, you know, right. for charges to not be more flow. And it was only proposed for bonded orbits. And uh, it has been extended now for uh, spinning lactose, non -set, and also for uh, unbonded trajectory mm -hmm. And it has been, it has been uh, suggested, and this is actually very recently, that um, there is a certain certain conformal symmetry for instance equations and given symmetry is like the same given symmetry of the trojan atom class and it's a given conformal symmetry. So the same kind of symmetry that the you know the Schrodinger equation has uh, allows you to basically um, trans allows you to implement the one body the one body technique, just yes, because this symmetry can kind of achieves the kinematic data of two body right. to one body. So there is a symmetry. So I'm 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 just gonna say something very very. Yeah, that could be a better, but it has been explained clearly. Right? Exactly. That's what I mean. So it, it has been a whole, yeah. There is a correspondence between the symmetry of the Schrodinger equation with which is a conformal symmetry. So two body uh, symmetry, two body symmetry of the effective one body. Right. Uh, and that would, you know, make up for a universal kind of reason. There's, right. there's nothing like there's nothing like a mathematically rigorous understanding of collision of two black holes. There's nothing like an no, understanding. No, I'm talking about the one body. That's that's what I'm saying. The yeah. one body is a symmetry of the problem that we probably don't understand. It's like it's, it's the ability to map the two body, you know, two body collision to an effective one body background that. You know, you compute the yeah. realistic equation. So there is some under, there is some underlying yeah. you know symmetry principle governing this. This right. is math now we probably don't understand, but in certain simple cases it can be understood from this simple showing the equation. At the at the risk of, of speaking too quickly, because I want to think about all of this much more. I think this is a really important point because I think there is a that my kind of difficulty with the representationalist or the inferentialist view is that it's a false dilemma, right? So the idea is either we have 
a sort of substantive solution that's backed up by evidence in this particular uh, domain, or it's entirely adventitious and we just make something up and say, well, maybe it's in the shape of a butterfly. And, and that, I mean, that's a ridiculous oversimplification, right? But um, say anything goes basically to use all fire oven. And I think that there's something in the middle where you can say, well, look, there's a tractable set of solutions and then we can use conformal mapping or approximation or perturbation or something to show why validly, right? This set of solutions would also work in this domain. And so it's not as if there's a complete substantive solution where there's, you know, everything is backed up, but it explains why you would look here rather than somewhere else, for instance. So, so it explains why, it explains why you would say, you know, we want to look for in LISA for extreme mass ratio cases because those can be explained using the physics and using mathematics. That doesn't that doesn't mean that there's already, you know, a good understanding that there's already. Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of papers being written right now about how like LISA physics is going to be really interesting because there's a lot of stuff that isn't known, and that's precisely what makes it interesting. Ah, yeah, you should. <laughs> Uh, I'm a little bit curious about uh, the relationship with this and I guess like other problems because it seems like when it comes to the surrogate um, way of thinking, it seems like there's this idea that there's a true model or yeah. something that we consider as true and something that's not true, but kind of is a good analogy. Right. But uh, there are a lot of times in situations in physics where you have two models that are just as predictive. Yes. And uh, um, it turns out that like later on, someone kind of shows that they're exactly the same under some certain mapping. But yeah. In, in that situation, would, would that it, could you make a similar argument, putting that more on the structural instead of the surrogate, or does it fit perfectly within the surrogate? No, that's that. I think is the structural. The argument would be that there's something structural that got that was being caught onto there, that that explains the similarity between the two models and why they both work. That just isn't yet understood. So, there are there are famous cases in physics of that happening. I'm sure we're thinking. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, I, I, I guess a good example is like matrix mechanics compared to like yes. wave mechanics, say like quantum mechanics, All right? Or like concepts of duality uh, that pop up in physics all the time. Uh, it seems like they're they're there's like the same on this some mapping. Like there's no. It, it just depends on how you interpret things. Yeah, there there are, and well, and there are very. Going back to high school physics again, there are very simple examples like Hamiltonian and Lagrangian mechanics. You know, you can you can translate one into the other, um, but that took a while for people to understand. At, at first, they thought they were doing two completely different things and pursuing different um, different sort of uh, paradigms, I guess. So, are you saying that's more structural because I guess the relationships in both models are the same, even though things are I guess organized differently? I'm saying that in many, okay, I should be more careful. I'm saying that in many of the cases where it can be proved that there is a substantive similarity rather than just an apparent similarity, that reasoning is structural. So you can show, so for instance, in the, I'm not gonna be able to remember this and you guys will know, but in the case of Hamiltonian and Lagrange two mechanics, you do the, is it the Lagrange transform and you can show that one, uh, that inferences in one are, are, the, are the proofs in one can be actually shown to be mutatis mutandis proofs in the other. And so there's a case where there's actually a mathematical um, proof of a structural similarity. And you can't always get something like that, but I think in many cases, what you've got is actually a lot more than just saying, well, we chose this representation and then we chose that representation. It just so happens that they share some similarities. It turns out that there's a structure that's similar. What that means is, is the, the sort of $20,000 question, but um, exactly. Yes, last two questions by Andy and then Rob. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could comment on the, on the phone. I wonder if, like, um, the, actually the equation of two black holes is a very simple problem in the sense yeah. that we nobody is wondering what the equations are that describe it. And so I'm wondering how you're, and at the end of the day, we would all agree that whatever the computer spits out is, is going to be the right answer. But there are more, um, I wonder if you could comment on how, so the differences between these different kinds of reasonings might be more pronounced like in other examples. Like one that comes to mind is heavy ion collisions where you take a heavy atom and you throw an electron right. at it. 
And there's something called the chloroplast condensate model, which has dominated this field. It's a huge field. Okay. And they, they have a billion dollar accelerator now. Oh. And, and um, this chloroplast condensate has no derivation from first principle, physical principles of any kind. Some people made guesses, which were refined over the decades about how you describe this, what the relevant degrees of freedom are, which were refined over the decades, partially with using theory, but also with input from experiment. You know, this model right. can't be right. And so there, what the rules, <laughs> what the rules are, are, it, is, would there then be a real, what will, how would your framework address something like that? Yeah. So, so this is where we get into a separate question, <laughs> yeah. which is about, um, so, so I just made that this distinction between, okay, there, there can be a, there is the kind of gold standard, which is that there's a solution to the equations, there's empirical evidence in favor of it. it we think of it as a well-confirmed theory. Very um, rare. Very rare, Buffer would get very, very mad. mad. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's the kind of the, that's the, the goal usually, I, I think. Um, even if it's unachievable. Um, but so clearly, if there's a case where there's a sort of hypothetical model that works well in certain cases, but there is empirical evidence against it, right? There's a test that it fails or something like that. Then we have to figure out, is this just a case? And, and this is one thing that I think people, people try to figure out every day, right? Is this just a case where we're using one thing to represent another, and this is just not, this is just a case where it doesn't fit. Or is it actually evidence against this model as a valid sort of representation of that system? And I think that's where the interesting sort of uh, rubber hits the road kind of uh, yeah. reasoning comes in is where you say, look, you're never going to have a perfect model. You're never going to have something that perfectly represents what it's about, um, or very rarely, as you say. Um, and not, not in an interesting case. But you are gonna have to be able to decide in a particular case whether, look, this is something that doesn't have to matter that much because it's just about, look, yes, this fluid is granular and we're representing it using continuous methods, but that doesn't matter in this particular case because we can remove the approximation versus this is evidence against this model, right? This is something that, that actually falsifies the model and shows that we should seek another one. And I think one of the things that's important about getting this right about what we're doing here or what you are doing here is that that gives us a better explanation of what happens in those kinds of cases. Um, saying that this is a deeper structural type of explanation or reasoning is something that gives you a better explanation of scientific change in that case. Why, why do people make the decision to seek another theory or to look, look elsewhere? Um, and it's sometimes because they figure out this isn't just about how good our representation is, this is this is something that shows that it's evidence against the theory. And you have to be able to tell those two things apart in particular cases. So, yes. so I, yeah. Last question. Yes, yeah, sorry. And, uh, happily, the question I was planning to ask was largely asked and discussed. So I think the only thing that I can, I can just add into it is that the difference that we have between the physics and mathematics that uh, some people like Martin or just, you know, highly actually motivated on that is that they have intuition. Like, I think that that was just kind of the things that you guys mentioned a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. The fact is that, you know, sometimes when you talk about the mapping between one or two, the yes. intuition will help you out. Sometimes we have learned in the, you know, very basic actual physics that sometimes going to the, some extreme limits or whatever will yes. help you out to just like make the intuition. So even though you don't understand what's going on in detail, at least you can just say that at this limit or at other limits or whatever, this story works well. So yes. that's kind of like the benefits that I think I can just say remarkably mention that physics has, you know, I guess I'm like, I really have no, That's no, really no. the case, you know, <laughs> you're just describing the real world, not really something that's just like, you know, auto right. access. So then like what Andy said, actually, then, the things becomes more difficult when you want to describe something that doesn't have such a boundary. So in this case, it's just life becomes extremely hard, like extreme theory. And you know, these people are remarkably clever, so they, they just figure it out, but it's just very really non-trivial for that part, what would be the right model to describe the reality when you don't have such an intuition to begin with. 
And I, and I think this is a, just to follow up on the, I don't really have an answer to that because I agree. I, I think that this is this kind of judgment um, is exactly what's what's interesting about sort of figuring what philosophers call the context of pursuit, like figuring out where to go next um, and figuring out how to avoid the alleys that lead nowhere and, and, and so forth. And so I think that's the that's that's really the question is, you know, it's not just a formal decision. It's also a decision about where are we going to put our billion dollars and um, that's kind of just just a finger uh, on Alfredo's point and also on your point that that the what what's what's really for me mysterious wonderful wondrous and all the rest of it is that say in the effective one body case there is some kind of articulation of what that mapping is right maybe the conformal symmetry you mentioned what's wild to me is that for for even a bit more complicated a case where we can't make these assumptions of treating the things of perturbation, et cetera. There is no known articulation of how we're going to intuit our way to the model. That, that's really kind of amazing because we, we just don't know. Well, there's, no, there's, no, there's no articulation of like what, what kind of degrees of freedom, what kind of variables should I be looking at? Why is my approximation and my numerical? Uh, no guidance. There's no yeah. guidance. Really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Before closing, uh, Peter asked me to read this message. Uh, Lydia, everyone, excellent talk. I'm sorry I have to go to give a talk myself now, but I look forward to talking with you about it. And let's make another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And we will see you in two weeks. After, because in one week, it's uh, academic.